Okay, so thank you very much for the introduction and uh, congratulations to this space. This is really uh, uh, also from a design perspective an amazing step you're going. We really think design and engineering and you, as you said uh, business should be interconnected and I think also the location is really important not only in the sense of talents coming to the Berlin and Brandenburg region but also to for the companies in this area as you said collaboration is really important and what we can learn from IT and design uh, is really getting into all of our lives and affecting basically all aspects of our work and that's also a little bit uh, our topic today uh, we thought preparing for this uh, keynote today, we would like to talk about three topics which are maybe really relevant for this space, but also for the, for the audience and for the region. We would like to talk about new work because this is something we are really uh, strongly believing in and I think uh, uh, both our uh, uh, speakers before us already mentioned this. We would like to talk about uh, upcoming technologies which will affect our lives in many aspects, Internet of Things. And we will talk about another aspect which is really important for the Berlin way of innovation, the startup culture. So it's a very ambitious talk and I'm very happy Nancy is with me. Nancy is our managing director at IXDS. We are a company of around 75 people with space in Berlin and Munich. And we help large organizations but also startups to bring a, a customer perspective to their services and to their products. And Nancy will basically guide us through the new work aspects. Yes. Um, so thanks for having me. And um, let's start. Um, new work. So why are we talking about new work? We are a design studio, um, obviously. And um, while we usually help clients um, really focus on what um, people out there want and build healthcare products, mobility products, whatever they need um, and make uh, their life more, more uh, improve their lives. Um, we, we came across in many of our projects and many of our um, work uh, challenges with our clients that um, uh, designing good products and services isn't really all and that um, the big challenge is also in, in these big corporations to um, build the capabilities to deliver on that. So um, lots of our activities by now, um, and this is just an, an extract um, uh, that you can see all the different activities that we do in in that space um, have turned into um, thinking about new work and helping big corporations as well as uh, smaller organizations, uh, German uh, Mittelstand, um, really thinking about how do we change our um, organization so that we are actually able to deliver on this. We do lots of HR safaris where we have HR people come over. Two days ago we had a team from Siemens there. And um, we really think that design practices and everything that we do to design really good products and services can actually apply it in the HR space and in um, redesigning organizations. And the same approach that we are taking when we're designing um, products, um, where we build lots of prototypes and we test and we iterate, the same approach we are actually taking uh, when we're designing organizations. And we test lots of that on our own. So we have, um, at the moment, seven prototypes running on redesigning IXDS. And we, we are um, being interviewed a lot on, um, um, on, on this topic because uh, RTL was recently over because they thought our 32-hour work week is already really progressive, so everyone at IXDS only works 80%. But there's lots of other things that we've put in place, and we, we believe we really need to be more progressive to be able to tell everyone else how to do it. And that's why we are um, talking about this topic. So there's um, obviously tools out there um, that already help make organizations better places and that help us redesign work. This is just a couple examples. Um, we, we use Slack or Trello uh, a lot for improving our communication or improving how we do things and work with it. But there's also um, uh, things like LinkedIn. I mean, no one really wants to update contact bases and Outlook anymore and um, keep information up to date. So that's really something that should be owned by the people People. But then there's also limitations in all of these tools today. Um, they all don't really work super well together. Um, of course, um, there's, a, there's a list of profiles in, in LinkedIn where um, I, can look at, uh, I can look at people, but I can't really work with them. There's nothing like I can't group people. I can't uh, actually work with those profiles and uh, manage them within my organization. And I mean, obviously, Microsoft buying LinkedIn um, probably has some ambitions in that space. Um, but that's all not very new for you at SIP. Um, so what we've picked out uh, is a six aspects that we think are really important to understand in the world of new work, um, because that will really influence how we how we deal with designing tools for it, because we really think you need to understand what is happening out there and how organizations will work in the future to be able to design the right tools for it. 
So the first point I'm making is um, respond to rapidly changing markets. And that's basically the point that no leader out there in the future will be able to take decisions on, the, on, him, uh, on his own, basically, or her own. Um, because we really believe, and you need to um, crowdsource the smartness of teams, and um, you really need to be looking at how do you, how do you make an organization and um, the crowd um, help you make those decisions that you need to be making. Um, so the question is, how would a service look like that allows us to crowdsource opportunities, that visualizes collective wisdom, and um, that allows for collective and tr uh, transparent decision making? And with all the work that we are doing, um, we really feel that there's a shortfall on tools that actually allow us to do that. We've picked out one um, as an example that has started to go into that space, but it's really just one example. But um, it's, it's crowdwise. It's basically a software that allows you to do exactly that, to um, ask your organization and, and the, the software is smart enough to actually identify the experts in, uh, for the question or for the challenge that you're putting out there and um, incentivizing people to give their opinion. And it's all anonymous, but it's actually giving you a direction on how you as a leader might want to take decisions. So the next point um, is about roles and people really um, and the, like many organizations out there still think in job profiles and they're putting job uh, openings out there and um, that's really not how organizations in the future will be working. Um, we will all be talking about roles and individuals taking on roles in organizations but everyone every one of us will have many roles in an organization and those roles aren't permanent. They're basically based on challenges that we want to solve and then we come together in circles to solve those challenges and when, once the challenge is solved then we're taking on a new one. And um, that's something we really believe in. We need to like get rid of uh, super standardized role profiles and uh, the, or job profiles and the, the uh, idea that um, I'm taking on this job and then that's it for the next 10 years and, uh, and it's just going to stay relevant because that's not how it is. So we basically, we basically need to keep learning and the interesting thing in that is also that I might have a very expert role in uh, like a specific case because that's what I'm the expert in but I might actually be part of another team where I'm having a much more junior role because that's the thing I want to learn about and this continuous learning is also a really important topic for us. So how do we make that work? And same thing here, um, there's... Um, the question of how, how would a service look like designing, uh, designing the service that allows us um, to actually respond to this. And one, top, uh, one uh, software that we've picked out that we think is um, going that into that direction, it's also not perfect yet, but at least they're thinking into that direction, is Glassfrog, which is the software out there for holography um, organized organizations, so everything that's around self-organized um, um, organizations. And what you see here is um, uh, the circles that they're building around certain challenges and the roles in there, and you can, you can actually go in and see what's the accountability of a specific role, and people can have many roles in many different um, topics. And if, if they can actually see where there's an opening for a role and then move themselves into the role. So it's, it's, very, it's very flexible and fluid and um, yeah, that's just one of the examples. There's one, of the, there's one detail we really liked about this software. If you leave a role you already have, you have to also look for replacement. So and I think that's quite mm. smart because it, it really needs you then to get other people excited about this role and find the right person to do it. Mm -hmm. So next one, um, we really believe that um, in the future we'll be much more looking at um, the, the mission of a company and the beliefs that we need to share. So it's not about um, um, anyone uh, getting a job or uh, uh, just because it's well paid and because uh, it's close to my hometown or whatever, but people are really much more driven for like around the challenges and the mission that the company is setting out there. And, um, at the same time, the organizational borders are becoming more fluid. So the whole thinking of this is my organization and that's it, it's just really old-fashioned because we really think people need to look at networks and building networks and being open and then really working with those people that share the same beliefs and how to drive that forward. Same thing here, um, we, we really don't think there's, a, there's a, we're missing the tools to make this happen and we really need to design for them. Um, one. Here we are. So one um, company that has looked into that is somewhere, which is um, they are trying to redesign how recruitment works. Um, they are basically saying um, this is a this is a 
um, a place where people come together and they all, it's all centered around values and beliefs and um, we as an organization are there and then there's people there and um, we all just talk about our um, like shared culture and everything that there is. There's no dedicated job um, openings there, but it's basically building your network with people that you think are driving in the, in the same direction. And then as soon as there is a conversation about um, actually an employment that can also happen there too, but it's a very different approach from um, traditional monster websites or where there's, it's all about job openings, but you know very little about the company and the mission behind. And the people, and and the the people behind. And also I think this fluidity of the, of the borders of being an employee or a freelancer or a partner is really something which is going to be challenged. And I'm, I, I have the feeling it's already in reality it's challenged, but the, the legal situation is of course lacking behind and I think that's quite a, an interesting situation uh, to have you here today because yeah. I think there is a lot of things uh, also which needs to adapt in that sense. Yeah, <laughs> so there's lots of stuff and uh, lots of ideas we have how we would actually like to redesign IXDS which we can't do at the moment because of uh, the way German Arbeitsverträge are, need to be. So, but that's, that's another story and we're working <laughs> on it. Um, so the next one is um, about how do you empower individuals to take decisions? So we are really convinced that once you have a, a, a specific set of uh, standards values. and values defined, that um, it's not about control anymore. And people become a lot more autonomous to actually be out there in the field and take decisions on their best knowledge and everything that they need to do. So we believe there's a, there's a, um, th th there's a much better ways to empower people to drive things forward, and um, it really goes together with how you, how do you organize um, around a holacracy-based um, um, system. And I mean, it pays in also in the speed which is needed to, to drive innovation and to be ready to react to the market. If you have to go all the levels up to the top and then uh, report an, an observation and then uh, go down again, it, it takes far too long and you cannot experiment enough. Yeah, so here we have a quote. Um, <laughs> um, that basically, I know that there's lots of criticism also around Uber and um, how it's organized, but we need to be thinking in this way. We need to be thinking on how can we build organizations that are a lot more flexible and that can allow um, every employee to basically work as much or as little or in the circumstances that uh, they can actually handle. So. Um, we at IXDS, for example, we would love to um, be more progressive. We don't think a 32-hour work week is actually that progressive. We've had that for 10 years. So we really think there needs to be more than that. And, um, and uh, what we are looking at at the moment is, like, can we move into time contingents where people, like, we, we commit, like, a certain security and people commit a certain amount of their time, but how they then use that up over time, um, that should really be flexible because there's, like, difficult phases in life and there's easy phases in life and I can work seven days a week for uh, two months if I'm really excited or I have nothing else on my plate, but then I should be able to work three days if there's actually lots of trouble in my family. And all of that is really difficult to actually actually manage at the moment because we're missing the tools and because of lots of the regulations out there. So, um, yeah, how does a service look like that gives everyone the desired flexibility um, that allows for accountability and organizational success, of course? We have... One example here, um, Zappos, for, for those of you who know Zappos, um, it's one of the most progressive companies out there at the moment. They, they've, they're working on this topic, future organization, for many years. They've built mo many of their own tools. And one of the more recent, recent ones is, is Open Market, where they've, they, where they've solved the challenge because they have lots of call centers. Um, they're, they're basically doing e-commerce and they have lots of call centers. And they always had the problem that they're having shifts. Um, they were doing like really complicated shift calendars and there were lots of shifts that people didn't want to take because they were really early in the morning but there was the times that actually the customers would would have needed them to take more shifts because that's the times when everyone was calling so there were really long waiting times and they were saying like so how do we solve this problem and um, they designed this open market um, where basically the whole like stuffing of shifts is now handled by the employees themselves where they are actually taking the shifts that they want to do and for those that are really unpopular but really important they get paid a lot more so if I'm actually taking the unpopular Uber. shifts, yeah. um, 
it's the same principle as yeah. Uber, yeah. Um, if I'm taking the unpopular shifts, I need to work a lot less, but maybe to not that, that convenient hours. And that should really be something that needs to be like flexible and managed. And there's, they are actually saving a lot of money and time and someone's sitting there doing, uh, doing the planning. Um, collaborate is... Um, I, yeah, I need to hurry up a bit. <laughs> Collaborate <laughs> is one of the um, our like main things. You need to stop thinking in your organization, but you really need to think what's best for the uh, client out there or the customer. So uh, that might actually mean that you need to partner with your competition to build something that's actually making sense and that's not um, in this uh, silo thinking. So here we have um, what do we need to do. And one of the companies that um, we really think has done an amazing job. It's one of the leading examples in the whole industry 4.0 case in Germany. It's Exum. So this is a software, uh, a platform being built by Trumpf. Trumpf is this um, big company, machine building company. And uh, they've said the innovation, um, there's no like more potential and in innovation than just building better machines. But we need to be thinking on how can we support our clients better and actually pro uh, for them to manage their production. So they've built this platform where now they have all their competitors, as you can see, on the platform and it's managing um, production facilities. And it's an amazing example on um, stopping the silo thinking, but thinking and partnering. Um, so then my last point before I'm handing over to Reto is um, think beyond software. So it's not just about software tools, but it's work actually means we need to be thinking complete, like in hardware, in um, ecosystems. And um, there's one really good example um, that we've picked out. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, is uh, the Proglov, which is also from Germany, because we, uh, and what they've been doing, they've been looking at uh, production processes and uh, factories, and they've integrated smart technology into this glove that actually helps with lots of the steps in the uh, facilities. So um, hardware is a big point in making our organizations better and making the workplace better. And now I'm handing over to Reto. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks a lot. <laughs> Exactly. So it's a good uh, point to talk now about IoT. And uh, I mean, I don't have to show the graphs of how important IoT is going to be. I think particularly for Germany, the German medium-sized companies, which are great manufacturing uh, machine producers, which are, uh, which are very close to, to, to doing excellent work uh, with, their, with, uh, with their production. I think IoT will, will uh, offer a lot of opportunities, but also, of course, a lot of threats. And I think you're all aware about, uh, about these things. And uh, I'd like to take you through a couple of uh, positions we are having here. The one Nancy already mentioned, when we talk to our clients, for example, class, uh, and uh, the same is, by, uh, by the way, Trumpf also said this. They say, well, the level we can innovate on hardware is reaching a certain le limit. It's there, the trucks are, he, uh, the, the chief uh, designer at uh, class said, well, they are 89%, 98% uh, uh, they are done. And there is not much you can do. And that's, of course, a very challenging situation. You can also see this in a lot of acquisition, merger and acquisition in this area, because the competition cannot... Um, it, uh, survive through innovation in the hardware itself. It has to be done in an other area. Uh, the other thing, of course, you do IoT and you can put it in. And by the way, I forgot to introduce this cup. Uh, this is a cup we did for the Wired magazine. And it's a, it's a connected cup for the readers. They could buy a kit uh, for 20 euro and connect their cup to the internet. And it's, uh, in, it's interesting not only to show how easy it is, but also that the whole technology to connect things to IoT is really getting super easy. So it's not a technological challenge anymore. It is, a, it is really a design challenge. And uh, one of the design challenges I would like to, to threaten is the, the normal IoT services you come up with when you think about it. For example, uh, maintenance, or uh, a remote control, that's why I put this image, they are commodity these days. So this is also not an innovation which will make more people buy your machines. They are getting more and more a commodity, and therefore we think you need to think much stronger in, on services which are enabled through IoT technology. And let me show you some, some example in that field. Uh, one of the examples uh, uh, is, and, and I think the services, as Nancy already said, Nate, 
need to understand the customers very well. And therefore, uh, we need design methods because that's one of the methods we are having in design to really understand what people, what drives people, what motivates people, what they are afraid of. That's a milking robot. Uh, which is connected and which allows the cow to get in, etc. And amongst others, of course, it can measure everything. And again, they have a, a very strong service proposition because if this breaks down, the cows get uh, within uh, a couple of hours. Uh, it's very dangerous for the cows to not be milked. But also, they can check the health status of each individual cow and also help uh, farmers to work much more uh, preci precisely with their with their uh, animals. The other example is again a platform similar to what we discussed with Axum. So Farmnet 365 is uh, by class, and they also uh, they built a platform to help farmers basically to run their farms. And I think that's an interesting uh, value proposition. You have been selling tr uh, trucks and tractors for a long time, but now you all of a sudden say, well, we we. We have been helping farmers for a long time, but now we're helping them on a different level. And again, they opened also up for a lot of uh, competitors and, and uh, partners, which you don't think in the first place, like Allianz, for example. So I think it's interesting how the things Nancy just talked about are really affecting the way products are developed and IoT is getting into our lives. So I jump over this because we talked already. And uh, now I make a s shift from a thing we learned uh, doing innovation for many years and which we also teach at the Fachhochschule Potsdam is really, I think, the, this world is so new and the prediction in this world is, uh, is really hard to make. There were a lot of mistakes of really super experienced people from uh, Steve. My favorite is Steve Balmer, who really said, what, an iPhone? Who the hell wants to? There's this very funny video on where he says, who the hell wants to use an uh, iPhone? Uh, when it was out, so nothing in, in some press announcement. And so we think we can learn a lot from startups and how they do innovation. And I'd like to point out three things which I really think are important and which, uh, which I think is a new way of approaching these challenges. One is the lean innovation, so to be sh uh, schlank. Lean, lean innovation is really um, uh, since five years out and is, uh, is a method to really avoid designing and producing huge systems with a lot of investment that nobody needs at the end. And uh, it, it, it's about really getting prototypes, getting something out as soon as you can. We talk about the, uh, the build, measure, learn cycle. So you build something, uh, you have an idea of, of what is needed, you build it as fast as possible, and even if it's, if it's, I mean, that's really hard for us Germans because it's not finished, of course. <laughs> so you build it as fast as possible and you get it out in the front of customers. So you don't test it in some labs, usability labs or things like this. You really get it out and you, it, you have people paying for this and they will then tell you whether they like it or not. And, um, we are, we are very, and then you learn from this. You measure the results, you see, are people using it the way you intended it? Uh, are they really paying or are they stopping the payment immediately and things like this? And then you learn from this and then you redo it. So it's not done, but it's really in cycles. And I mean, one example we did with Bosch, I think uh, Bosch is also a very interesting company to look at because they basically decided to do all their innovation as a startup. So one of the methods you employ is the so-called landing page. So you basically fake and say, there's a service, would you be interested in it? Even so, the service was not even done. There was a, a photo of the service. And then you can see how people react to it and whether they really register and download, etc. And then you can tell them in the second step, oh, maybe next time, <laughs> wait a little bit. Uh, Another one which I just learned recently, but which is really important for me, is uh, start small. Start small in a very, very small area, and then try to be the strongest player in this area. And all the, uh, historically, all the American super IT companies we know about started extremely small. Just have a look here at um, Facebook. This is the first Facebook site, and it was only for students at Harvard University. And they managed within three months to get, I think, 60% of the students si uh, sign on. So they knew, ah, we have something which is really attractive and we can build a monopoly. And that's something we sometimes forget working with large corporations, that you think, well, this has to be bring happiness to everybody, to the entire world. But it's much more healthier to start with a very, very small group and to understand this group and to make this group help this group and then to grow from there. It's the same with Slack, really. 
um, the tool that I've introduced, because they've completely revolutionized communication. And it's a super small company, but every small organization is already using it. And I think the big corporations, they don't have it on their radar, but it's just a matter of time until that actually takes over. Yeah, we did an example in the health business for hearing aid. We started with the app where people, uh, young uh, uh, like us, <laughs> uh, would help their parents <laughs> to see whether they have a hearing aid problem with their smartphone. And it's a very targeted group. And now Mimi, they're called Mimi. Sorry, I forgot to put the name. Uh, Mimi is becoming the, one of the key players in the hearing aid industry. And the last one, and I think it sums up what you do here, is really you need to give innovation space. And I think it's really nice what you did here with this space. It's really important to have an open space, to be able to invite people, uh, to, to exchange ideas, to, to, to be, we try uh, with our space also to be not inside, outside, but sometimes people end up in our office and thinking it's a restaurant. And uh, this is exactly what we want, because I think this exchange is really important. But also, in another sense, you need to give innovation space within the corporation. Uh, this is such a risk, and I think uh, SAP is showing really nicely how to do it. It's such a risky thing, and it might threaten your own business. It, but it, ha it is important that these threatening situations are happening, and therefore the people should not be controlled by uh, every senior manager or by HR rules, etc. I think a shared value, this is really important, but it, besides this, you need to give innovation space. And that's basically uh, the last, uh, the last uh, slide we would like to share with you. As said, we want, I, I really I hope we understand uh, the, how important a new understanding of work is. And uh, we thought maybe it would be even interesting to look at these ideas of tools together. <laughs> uh, uh, but I think a new work will need new software tools, and this is a big challenge. IoT is a great chance for Germany, and especially for the German uh, uh, Maschinenbau and, and Mittelstand. But I think really there's uh, great opportunities, but also there it's not a technical solution, it's a design challenge. And as said, startup culture might be a method to approach this. Thank you uh, for your uh, attention. Thank you.